We're going to be back in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We went through the first few verses. I'm going to go through them just briefly again, and then we're going to spend our time focused on verses 4 through 6. I will read those verses aloud, and then we will get into the lesson. Verse number 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's a great title, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, and if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So we're, uh, we're, we, you know, we saw a couple things. First of all, that Christ is our advocate. We have an advocate with Christ. He is the one that is before the throne and is the devil accusing you of living a life that is contrary to Jesus Christ? The answer is yes, of course he is. Uh, what do we know about Christ, though? Because our righteousness is not on us, it's on Christ, that the advocate has something to actually show to the judge, and that is his righteousness before God. And then not only that, we get to see that he's our propitiation. Uh, he is the one that covers our sin. He's the one that takes care of those things. And that's great. And not only did he die for those who are saved, who did he die for? The entire world. His, his blood is sufficient to anyone that calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, I do not believe in the Calvinistic doctrine of limited atonement. I, am a, I know there's some out there that believe differently, but I would say I'm a zero-point Calvinist by the way they define it. So I hope you're okay with that, Tino, because your approval on that is what matters most anyway. But as we walk through that, we go, great, that's all, that's all wonderful. Well, when we get to verse 3, and it says, and hereby we do know that we know him. And that's a great phrase. That's a great Bible phrase. It's one of those deals when you're studying scripture, like, that's a great phrase. We do know that we know him. That's a great thought. That's a great idea. Is God knowable? Is Christ knowable? And the answer is yes, he's knowable. And hereby we do know that we know him. There is a condition on knowing who Christ is, who your God is. And what is the condition? If you do what? Keep his commandments. In John, Jesus speaking in chapter 14, I think he also says it in 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's an obedience that's required. And if you want to know who Christ is and how he operates and how he works, the thing to do is to keep his commandments. The thing that Christ clearly tells us to do, we should do. And the law of Christ, the two laws of Christ, uh, we mentioned it last week, is to love God and how much are you supposed to love him? With all your heart. Now, is that easy to understand? In other words, you can say that, but how hard is that to practice? I love a lot of things. I'll go to a restaurant. Do we like almost overuse the term love? I love this role. I love this whatever. I lo oh, I love this. Our attention can be distracted, but who are we primarily supposed to love? God. And we're supposed to love him with all our hearts, all our mind, all our soul. Great. And then what's the second law of Christ is to love your neighbor as yourself. So that's a lot of love. And if we follow loving God and loving people, the other commandments fall in line and we're supposed to do all that. So the more we keep his commandments, the more we can know him, which is important to, to follow through on when you're looking at verses four through six. And so when we're looking at three, we do know that we know him. Basically what you're doing is look at that word keep. The word keep here in this context means to observe as in obedience. Obedience to Christ is a clear indicator that one's received him as Savior. Implied is a routine. Disobedience to Christ is an indicator of the opposite. Have you ever checked your own pulse? Yeah. 
if you have heart issues, you're probably really checking your pulse. And if you don't feel anything, you're probably in a whole lot of trouble. For a while, there was like a month last year, I was going through some extra stress and my heart kept skipping a beat. By the way, it's very disconcerting when your heart skips a beat. And I was like, man, it feels weird. And you'd go, do-do-do-do. Do 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 my cool. Very disconcerting. You check your pulse. And the reason you're checking your pulse is to make sure things are working normal. They're 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 operating the way they should. And if you hear a steady beat in a certain rhythm, like your heart rate shouldn't be 150 if you're just sitting around reading your Bible, right? I mean, I know the Bible's exciting, but generally not that kind of excitement. Your heartbeat should, you know, I don't know, a resting heartbeat if you're athletic should be under 60 if you're just resting and all that and you check your heart and you're checking those things. What scripture is doing is it's checking your pulse, is making sure that you're in line with what's going on. And when you're reading God's word, when you're trying to keep his commands, what you're doing is you are checking your pulse. So then what, what you find out in these last verses is Christ expects us to live by example. That is the main point of this. Not only are we supposed to read the Bible, not only are we supposed to understand the Bible, not only should you understand what the different books of the Bible and all the definitions and study and read up on it, you know Christ wants you to apply the Bible. You can just have John 3.16 memorized and apply what you know, and I'm not saying you want to stay there, but you can start out pretty well. The Bible you have in front of you, know it the best you can, apply it the best you can, and start moving forward. We are supposed to live by example. So here are these verses. Verse four. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. When I first got saved, I've told the story, but for those new here, it'll be, what year is it? 2024? It'll be 22 years this week. I got saved. Amazing. I got saved 22 years ago. It's amazing. Fantastic. I did not grow up in a Christian home, so it wasn't one of those deals where I didn't know I was saved and all that. I just, I did not grow up in a, in a let's say, a home that was, you know, a Baptist type home, etc. So, the day I accepted Christ as my Savior, what do you guys think I did? I went home and had a Bible study. Now, pretend I live in Wisconsin, and I grew up in Wisconsin. What do you guys think I did? I had a couple beers that night. Joel, Joel Nelson hit that one right out of the park. It was a beautiful, <laughs> it was a beautiful April night, so I... I go, I don't know, whatever. So just, I, I go out, and uh, lo and behold, I have a couple beers. No big deal. Especially back then. It would be a bigger deal now if the pastor goes out and does it. Anyway, but the next day, the girl who invited me to church, you know, we're working together. The next time I see her, she goes, she's talking to me, and she goes, <laughs> she goes you didn't go out drinking last night? And I'm like, no. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to, but I, once she asked, I'm like, you know, you ever get a question asked to you and you're just like, I can just tell by the question that what they're really looking for is they're kind of doing some digging. So I said, no, I did not. So the first thing I did when I got saved, I, got, I had a couple beers and I had a good time and all that. But that, uh, then, then I lied about it. That was the first thing I did was lied about it. And then for several months... Uh, I, I got saved. I, was not, I did not get saved at Wildwood Baptist Church. I got saved at a much different church than this. And, and I was living life. I was barely going to church at all. And, and after a few months of, of having Christ my Savior, this girl, I don't know why she wrote me this letter, but she decided to write me a letter. And she goes, you know what? You and your barstool evangelism. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It struck me to the, struck me to the core. And then I ended up showing up to Wildwood, and my life changes dramatically, you know, once I have this example and start taking my Christianity seriously and all that. But are there a lot of people who 
make this claim that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ and their life is not congruent. It's not, it's not what it should be. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. John becomes really frank in this whole thing. One claiming to know Christ and yet ignores his commandment, he's a liar. The truth personified is who? Christ. I am what in John 14, 6? I am the way, the, the life, the truth. The second thing in there is he is truth. Live like Christ lives. It's the truth personified in Christ. The verb tenses in 1 John are particularly significant. The word keepeth is conjugated in the present tense. Implied here, it's an ongoing action. So if I get saved and it's wonderful, how long should I start acting in a way that's pleasing unto Christ? I remember Pastor King years ago said, salvation's like this. It's not about works, it's not about works, it's not about works. And all of a sudden you go down the half pipe here. It's not about works, it's not about works, it's not about works. Then you get saved, then what is it? It's about works, it's about works, it's about works, it's about works. It's not the works that get you saved, but it's the works that show that you actually have a relationship with Christ. And what is my primary obligation to live righteously? First of all, it's to glorify God. That's the primary. What's the secondary thing? Who's counting on me to live a holy life? Does it matter if I live a holy life? Does it matter if I'm walking close to Christ? Who is watching me? The entire world. Whether or not I live good or bad, Simon sees it. He sees me here on a Sunday morning. I don't, he only sees me here on Sunday morning. I don't think we've ever seen each other out in public. But as a pastor, when you live in Oshkosh, do you think people are watching me at all? Do you think they know that I'm from Wildwood Baptist Church? There are people that will come up and go, you don't know me, but I know you. Is, are people watching? Uh, I, I've worked in a secular workplace for a long time. Do they know that I'm a pastor? Do they know that I'm a member of Wildwood Baptist Church? And whatever your workplace is, whatever your circle of friends, they should know that you're a Christian, that you attend a church that believes the Bible. And you know, there's a lost and dying world that's watching you. So primary thing is glorify God. But that secondary, the secondary role here is to do what? Make sure that I have a relationship with Christ that's so vibrant, that's so good, that I'm walking so close to him that a lost world goes, there's something different about him. Does that always mean they're going to want what I have? They, they may not want what I have. They may never want what I have. They may sneer, they may mock, but any of us that have worked in a workplace, out in the world, if you're living life, your neighbor, whoever, people are watching and when crisis comes to them, eventually they're going to come to you and go, how do you have peace in your life? I know that we act, at least I hope, I hope the reason you act the way you do is not because of obligation, because you feel you need to, it's because you want to. I want as many people in heaven with me as possible. I want, I want to fill heaven up. I want to take every soul I can out of hell and move them as close as they are, heading towards hell and move them towards heaven. I hope that's in your heart. And so he makes this comment, John, he's very pointed. It's an ongoing action. John is not so much writing about the Christian who occasionally slips, but rather he's speaking of one who routinely and continually is not keeping the commandments. John's verdict in such a case as this, is that one claiming to know Christ and they're acting in such a way as a liar. And even worse, the implication is such a one that's never truly been saved. When someone goes, do you think that person's saved? And they live like the devil and they've never made a commitment to Christ. They've never made a step towards Christ. They live just the way they live. Is that an indicator about whether or not someone's saved or not? It certainly is. If someone's living like the devil all the time, do you think maybe they should commit their life to Christ? Do I know if everyone's saved? Do I know the heart? I do not. But if I plant an apple seed in Bob's cornfield, something's not going to look right. One is not going to look like the other. If I plant an orange seed in Bob's cornfield, something's not going to look right. Of course, it'll probably get mowed down before it ever gets big enough, but let's assume he lets it grow. And in his cornfield, 
you see the apple tree out there and it's producing apples. He goes, well, this is a cornfield. Well, what's that? Well, that's part of the cornfield. Things that are different are not the same. If I'm observing somebody and they go, do you really think they're saved? Do, do you really think Chris is saved? Do you really think? I don't know. I don't know his heart. I don't know, I don't know the transactional side of it. I don't know what happened on, I don't know what day he got saved. Do you remember what day he got saved? Yeah. He'd know the day. He probably knows the place and all that stuff. I go, what day did you get saved? Go, did you say 79? Man, you're old. No, anyway. <laughs> I'm here to help. And I would, someone go, well, do you think he's saved? And I go, well, he shows up to church in a suit, which is the primary reason you can tell if someone's saved or not if they're wearing a tie. I'm kidding, by the way. Yeah. I would hope that I would look at his life and go, not only does he say this date, there's also a bunch of evidence. He was a missionary. He loves the Lord. He reads the Bible. He went to school. I could kind of add some things up, and I would, I would infer from his life that, yeah, he's saved. But let's just say he didn't have a change, and he still had that date down. Can I tell him he's not saved? I don't know what's going on between him and the Lord. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know what kind of torment he may be in if he's not following after the Lord. But if I had to confront him, I'd go, Some, something's not congruent here. Something's not right. You either need to get right or you need to get right. And there's going to be some walking down that path. And so it can be a tough thing, but I don't want to spend all this time on here. But that person who says, I'm saved and lives like the devil, there's a couple things going on that are just bad. First of all, they're not an example to the lost. You need to be an example of the lost. Second thing is, if their life looks like it's never changed, maybe their life never changed. Ten lepers get healed, how many come back? One. How many people have you led someone in a prayer? I'm not saying the prayer is what gets someone saved, but how many people have you led to Christ, maybe even discipled, and they're living just like they did before they ever made that commitment? How many people have been baptized in our church that weren't really saved? Yeah, I'm saying it's a tricky issue, but it deals with the heart. And when the reader is reading this book, it should challenge their heart to make a decision towards Christ. They're keeping, the word keep. So let's look in that next, let's look in that next um, verse. Whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. Again, the word, the word keepeth, that is here. It's in the present tense. It's those who continually keep his word. John goes on to note that this one verily, excuse me, that in this one, verily is the love of God perfected. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? Do you know any perfect Christians? Any perfect Christians you guys know? Anyone at all? Any perfect Christians at all? Larry? Anyone at all? Ken? Anyone you know? You guys are disappointing. I'm a pastor. I like when people say, well, you're a pastor. You think you're better than everyone else. Oh, yeah, that's me. Just one beggar showing another beggar where the bread is, right? So that word perfected is really interesting. The word perfected is very interesting. We, at times, will take the word perfect and think like it's actually like I'm without issue. I'm without I'm without sin, I'm in all that. And, and, and obviously that continual sin is a problem, but metaphorically meaning is to make perfect through an although not faultless, but bring into a state of completion or fulfillment. It means you're complete in Christ. If we were to look in Colossians, we can find that you are complete in him. I need nothing else. Is my salvation sufficient in Christ? My salvation is sufficient in in Christ. There is people that they go, yep, yeah, I, uh, I trusted Christ my Savior and dot, dot, dot. They start throwing in a bunch of other religious mumbo jumbo. Christ is sufficient. The Bible is sufficient. We are perfected in Christ. We are made complete in Christ. When we, and I know it's a different Greek word and I don't want to go into that 
too far, but when we look in Ephesians 4, it said God gave some preachers and teachers and all that for the what of the saints? The perfecting of the saints. That word perfecting there in that context has the idea of mending a fish net. So when you throw a net into the water, you don't want to have big holes in there, you want to catch fish, but if there's a hole in it, the fish are going to get through. So the idea in there is that you're completing the net so that you are actually complete, you're full. In here, it's it's a little bit of the same thing, which is what? Is that I am complete in Christ. I only need Christ to be sufficient. So let's read that over with that idea in mind when it says, whosoever keepeth his word, in other words, continually does that, in him verily is the love of God perfected. It's complete in him. Hereby, we know that we are in him. I have confidence that I'm in Christ. When you follow God's word, you're going to have a confidence that surpasses what the world has. How can you be a confident person, follow after Christ? How confident would I be if Bob said, here's my tractors, go ahead and work my fields? I don't know, do those things have keys? I don't even know what they do. My father-in-law, he uses this Model T. Good news is I'll never be able to steal it. Anyone tried to drive a Model T before? Has anyone in here has driven a Model T? There's like, I, I don't know. I can drive a stick, but this thing is far beyond that. It's levers and all this stuff. I couldn't, I couldn't steal it. I probably couldn't even get one of his tractors started. That's how hapless I would be. Would my confidence be different if I had Bob with me working a field with him? Sure, because I have someone who's gone through it. My confidence would exceed. Now, in a in a bigger sense, my life has much more confidence, not because of me, but because of who I'm with. When I navigate my life, and I got saved as an adult, I got saved in my 20s, do you know my confidence actually broke the moment I got saved? My confidence absolutely broke after I got saved. All my advice, all my quote-unquote wisdom, all those things that I had been trusted in were me. Then I show up here. And people keep quoting what? Scripture. And I'd show up to these Monday morning Bible studies with these old guys and they knew things. By the way, the old guys are probably about my age right now, but Ken would say something like, Ken is the smartest human being I've ever met in my entire life. He's so smart. And I'd be drooling on myself. I remember I would offer some sort of insight on some Bible passage. And I don't remember if it was Pastor King or Brother Ken or Brother Don or Brother Bob. And they go, actually, it's not that at all. It's actually the opposite. And I'm like, oh. You get saved. You're, and I want to say part of my, my confidence in myself completely breaks. But the longer I walk with the Bible, the longer I walk with Christ, my confidence increases. But it's not confidence in me. It's confidence in who? Christ. Because I know him. And the longer you walk with him, the greater your confidence is going to be in your walk. I'm confident in what he wants or doesn't want out of me. And that's fantastic. So let me get to this verse 6. And that's where we're going to just finish up here. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself so Also, so to walk, even as he walk. Let me just read that again because I sputtered it out. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. That word bideth, abideth. What does that mean? To live with, to be with, to, to be. I'm abiding in him. I'm abiding, I'm living in him. He that abideth in him, live with him, ought himself also so to walk. And so to walk can be figurative or fig, uh, figurative or literal. In this case, it's a, it could be figurative and literal. But I'm walking with him. Also so to walk. I'm walking even as he walked. Who are we trying to mimic? Who are we trying to replicate? Christ. Now, there are times when you see Paul. Paul says, you know, follow me as I follow up to Christ. And I'm like, okay, great. We see that example But primarily, who am I trying to emulate? Who showed the example? Christ. Christ did it. That is who I'm trying to follow after. How hard is that? Do you have perfect peace in your life? Do you have perfect judgment? 
Are you perfectly just? Are you perfectly, no, not necessarily, but do you have a perfect example to follow? And so when you're living life, by the way, if I were to ask anyone who's been doing this Christianity thing for some, some length of time, do you ever look back at your parenting and wished is a, is a big phrase, but do you ever think there's some things you could have, if you had to do it over again, you'd probably amend a little bit in how you parented? My wife could have did a way better job. But I could have did a way better job parenting. Is there things I wish in my marriage that I would have, I wish, is, again, are there some things I would have tweaked in my marriage earlier? Sure. Is there some things I would tweak in my walk with Christ? Absolutely. I would have certainly tweaked some things because he's the example and what happens is I'm living my life and then I put my life up to him and I go, well, that's not right. I have to trim that off. I have to fix this. I have to go there. And then I live it some more and then as I'm reading the Bible, as I'm praying, as I'm under God's, God's preaching, as I'm working through that, then I put that example up again and go, ah, oh, it's not there. Not there. I have to fix it again. And we're going through this, what we call conditional sanctification. I am working in my life to try to be as close to Christ as I can. Close as I can to the example. That word ought in verse 6 is of particular interest, and we'll end on that word. The word ought, like, you ought to, you ought to go this place. You ought to go do that. That's an ought of thing. We use it, we use it frequently, but the word ought here is of specific interest. It means duty. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk. It's your duty. If you say you live in Christ, what should you do? Walk like he walks. Talk like he talks. Try to live like he lived. Be compassionate, be loving, be gracious, be merciful. Have a backbone towards what God would have you to do. Be the person who's different. How many people just say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you'd never know it? How many times have you even said, well, I'm a Christian on Sunday, but during Monday to Friday, we have an obligation, a duty, through adoration first, but then we also have a duty to follow the example. If we had, I don't know how many people we have in here, 100, 115, there's 115 people in here and said, you know what I want to do? Today I want to walk and look and smell and be just like Christ. How much better would the church be? What if the pastor took one step closer to being like Christ? What if, and I could start naming people, what if you all just tried to be more like Christ? Can I just say you ought to do that? It's your duty to be more Christ-like. It's a super tough thing to do. So we'll keep walking through that. But the things that we need to just reflect on before I finish in prayer is, hey, it's your obligation. You ought to do it. But also through adoration, you want to do it. And if you want to know more about Christ, keep his commandments. You want to have the love of God perfected in us? Keep his word. Keep his word. And then as long as you have air in your lungs, do yourself the favor of trying to model yourself after Christ best you can. We're going to pray, and then we'll wrap up. I'm a little late today, and I, I hear the natives are getting restless. So, all right. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the example that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. As we kind of navigate through some tough things, I know that it's not works that saves us, but certainly the life that we live should be a sign that we have a relationship with you, that we should have some fruit that, um, that is shown. We should live a life that mimics Christ. I pray that as we navigate through, um, at times, difficult waters, that we would just simply trust in you, and that as we fail, as we stumble, and we consider where we are, that we would just con uh, continually set ourselves up against your son, Jesus Christ, that we would adjust our lives to be more like him. Lord, we do love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.